I was leading a retreat on the Brahma Viharas one time, when the question came up, given that the Buddha assumes that we're all basically good, how does he explain the evil in the world? And I had to say, wait a minute, the Buddha never said anything about people being basically good. What he assumes about people is something else, that we all want happiness. Of course, that makes it easier to explain why there's evil in the world, because people have some very strange ideas about how to find happiness. But that fact of desire, the Buddha said, all things are rooted in desire. All things skillful, all things unskillful are rooted in desire. And his purpose in teaching was to show people how to find true happiness in line with that desire. laying out what they should and should not do. Now, a lot of people don't like the idea of shoulds and should nots, but the Buddha said that was a teacher's basic duty, to give you a framework for understanding what kind of things should be done if you want to be happy, and what kind of things should not be done if you want to be happy. Now, he's not forcing this on you. It's a passage in the beginning of the Karnaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who appreciates the state of peace. I was sitting in on another course on the Brahma Viharas one time. They were going over that sutta. They hit the first line. As soon as they hit the word should, her hand went up. Someone said, I thought Buddhism didn't have any shoulds. The teacher had to spend the whole morning explaining why there could be a should in there. But it's not that difficult to explain. If you really appreciate the idea of peace as being the ultimate happiness, then this is what you should do. It's up to you to decide if that's the path you want to follow. Perhaps a lot of the problem about shoulds has to do with our background. You can think about Freud and his analysis of the mind. You've got the id, which is your basic desire, and you've got the superego telling you what you should and should not do. And the shoulds there have nothing to do with your happiness. It's not saying that you should do this if you want to be happy, simply you should do this. And so of course there's going to be conflict. Then the ego, which is in the middle, has to negotiate between the two and can never find peace because there's always going to be conflict. Whereas the Buddhist shoulds are of a different order. You look at the Four Noble Truths. These are the things you should do if you want to be happy. You should try to comprehend suffering. You should try to abandon its cause. You should try to realize the cessation of suffering. And you do that by developing the path. It's all about activities you should and should not do. It's also about directing your desires because of the craving that leads to suffering, the craving for sensuality, becoming, and non-becoming. It doesn't cover all the possible desires there are. There are also the desires to be skillful, to develop skillful qualities and to abandon unskillful ones. And that's in the other half of the Four Noble Truths. You can divide the four into two sections. There's the unskillful cause, craving, and the undesirable result, which is suffering. Then there's the skillful cause, which is an awaitful path. Well, you can't say the cessation is the result of the path, but the path takes you there. But an important element in the awful path is the right effort. The right effort is about generating desire to prevent unskillful qualities from arising, and if they have arisen, to abandon them to give rise to skillful qualities that are not there yet. And if they are there, then you try to develop them even further. Now the Buddha is basically saying, this is guidance for your desire for happiness. Now a lot of his analysis is counterintuitive. Take for instance his analysis of the First Noble Truth. He talks about the suffering of aging, illness, death separation from that what we love, having to be with things we don't like. Then he boils it down to the five clinging aggregates. The important word there is the clinging. The Pali term upadana can also mean to feed. 
this is where it gets counterintuitive. Because for most of us, our relationship to the world is that we want to feed off the world. We like to take in not only physical food, but we take in sights, we take in sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. Try to find some nourishment off of them. We feed on our intentions. We feed on our awareness. We're constantly trying to take things in, and that's precisely why we're suffering. And the Buddha talks about the ways to counteract this. You're changing your relationship. You start with generosity. You're finding happiness by giving things away. Now you will be feeding off the happiness that comes. But it's an initial lesson that a lot of good things in life, the best ways to feed is to do the opposite of feeding, is to radiate something good out. And same with the precepts. You're making a gift of safety to all living beings. Instead of taking things from them, you're giving them safety. And of course, with meditation. When they're talking about meditation in the context of the acts of merit, they're talking about developing goodwill. And here again, you radiate. You're not taking in. You're producing something from within that you can radiate out. It's a form of wealth that doesn't require that you take anything. You've got the resources inside, simply by the way you think. You can create a good energy, and you can create something that's a gift to others. And of course you benefit if you're going to have goodwill for all beings. You're very unlikely to do unskillful things. You're very unlikely to harm them. And that way you protect yourself. So this is the basic pattern of the path. Is instead of taking things in, taking things in, taking things in, we're learning how to radiate good things out. Like when you're meditating here right now, you're focusing on the breath. It may seem like it's just between you and your breath and nobody else is involved. But when the mind settles down, it does have an energy. That energy goes out. And when the mind settles down, it's a lot less likely to be hungry to act on greed, aversion, and delusion. So again, you're giving safety to other beings. We're looking for happiness in ways where there's no clear line between who benefits and who doesn't benefit. You, of course, are the prime recipient of the goodness of your actions and thoughts, words, deeds. But other people benefit as well. Which is why searching for happiness in this way is so good. I mean, people find happiness in material gain and status, getting praise from other people, looking for physical pleasures. But in those kinds of happiness, people, some people gain and other people lose. But in the happiness that comes from generosity, virtue, meditation, everybody wins. So this is a kind of pursuit of happiness that actually creates harmony in the world. We think about that phrase, the pursuit of happiness, and it sounds kind of grubby, and especially if you're looking for happiness where people have to fight one another, fight one another over what they're getting. But if you pursue happiness in a way that's wise like this, you're actually generating more well-being in the world at large. This is why I said that for the Buddhist shoulds. If the Buddha were to analyze the mind in terms of id and ego and superego, that's not the case that there has to be a conflict between the shoulds in the mind and the desires. Now there will be in the beginning, that's for sure, because you have lots of other shoulds going around in the mind based on what you've done in the past to find pleasures. 
and the mind may be addicted to those things. It resents being told, well, there's a, there's a better way of finding happiness. But the conflict is not unending. As you go through the practice, and you show to those parts of the mind that haven't been won over yet, that you really can be happy being generous. You really can be happy being virtuous, meditating, developing goodwill, developing concentration, gaining insight. You can win the whole mind over. And this is one of the ways in which we bring about unity of mind. My following shoulds that are aimed at happiness and really do work. So that's what's special about the Buddhist teachings. The shoulds are designed for you to be happy. So if you find that there's any conflict in the mind as you're practicing, it's not because the Buddha's shoulds are unreasonable or punitive. It's because there's a lot of ignorance still in your own mind about what actually would lead to a true and reliable happiness. So there's voices in the mind that can say, well, I can find some quick pleasures this way. Why bother with the long term? But that's the blindness right there saying that you don't care about the long term. So we all want happiness. The question is, do we care about the long term? And if you're wise, you'll say yes. <laughs> 